Welcome to Picture This, our podcast format, mostly audio. Today we're talking about how photography changes the world and who makes all this possible, Chelsea. This podcast is brought to you by Squarespace. Whether you need a domain, website, or online store, make your next move with Squarespace. They have beautiful award-winning design templates, all-in-one platform, and award-winning 24-7 customer service. Start your free trial today at squarespace.com slash Tony and use the offer code portfolio to get 10% off. Thanks, Squarespace. Thank you, Squarespace. Uh, let's, if you are watching this on YouTube, you might want to grab the actual podcast. You can visit stp.io slash podcast, and there you'll find links that'll take you to Google Play or the iTunes store so you can get it and listen to it while you drive or whatever. Though we will be showing some pictures and stuff, so there might be some benefit to actually watching. Yeah, we'll talk them through the pictures. I like the listening formats because I can listen while I cook or while I drive or... Photoshop. Photoshop or clean. We have to give a graphic content warning because some of the pictures that ended up changing the world most substantially were some of the most shocking visually. So there'll be images of like death and suffering. Not a lot, but a couple. Okay. I wanted to start by talking about how photography improves the individual because it does. It's a really like peaceful hobby, wouldn't you say, Tony? Yeah. And participating in the arts is something that I think contributes to someone's overall wellness. And aside from that, Tony and I have taught hundreds of thousands of people. We get a lot of emails and often they're really inspiring. We've known people that have been paralyzed that have used photography to see the world. Um, people going through various personal crises from personal loss to losing a job to making some big transition in their life. And what people tell us is that photography has helped them. It's given them some focus. It makes them see the world in a more positive way. Um, I've had a lot of people tell me that photography saved their life. Yeah. And not just one, but many people have told me that. Yeah, we're not exaggerating. For some people, when they're at their lowest moments, to have a hobby where they can really see the world and concentrate and be completely enveloped in something as positive as photography is, it's really helpful. And it can also... Uh, link you to a community of people. It gets you outside if you do wildlife photography or street photography. Um, it gives you a purpose to go out and to do something. Uh, and aside from that, I think overall, even if you're not going through a crisis in your life, it forces you to slow down and really look at your surroundings in a new way. I can say that when I had been doing photography for a while, I started seeing as a photographer and suddenly you're slowing down and you're looking at things like backlit leaves and how pretty it is when the colors change at sunset. And it takes you from this place of maybe rushing around and overlooking all of these simple little beauties in your life to suddenly seeing how beautiful it is to be anything at all. I find this a lot if I'm traveling, walking, driving with a non-photographer, Yeah, I'll be driving and I'll just say, oh my God, look look at that, that's gorgeous. Yeah, And the person will look over and be like, oh, yeah, that's really nice. But they otherwise wouldn't have noticed this at all. And one of my favorite stories is we were, we had our long lenses and we were chasing a bald eagle. And this bald eagle just landed in a tree about like five feet over somebody's head where they were washing their car or doing something in the yard. And we walked up and we were taking pictures of it. And the guy's like, what are you taking pictures of? And I said, there's a bald, bald eagle like right over your head. And he said, oh, I didn't know we had bald eagles around here. Yeah. But meanwhile, we saw these bald eagles every day. They were all around. But this guy and so many other people in the area think that they simply don't have the birds in the area because they aren't looking for them. They haven't learned to see. But every photographer knows that the area is completely populated with these things as well as beautiful sunsets and backlit yeah. dewdrops and so I, many other beautiful things. Well, I kind of love beginner photography for that reason is that you see a lot of cliches and we joke about them on our live show, flowers and you know little macro shots of things like keyholes, but it really speaks to photography that everybody slows down and starts to appreciate the same little thing. It's like flowers are everywhere, but you put a camera on someone's hand and suddenly they need to document that beauty. They need to go take a picture or they need to see what their baby's feet look like close up and have that memory forever. So we have all of these anecdotes and this personal experience 
But there are also people that have proven this with research, um, more specifically how art therapy in general can influence people's health. So you can check out the study that I read at stp.io slash art therapy. Um, it is on a government site. It's called The Connection Between Art, Healing, and Public Health, a review of current literature. And they go over different types of arts, but one of them is the visual arts. And one of the um, examples that they use is they took a group of women going through chemotherapy and they involved some of them, some of them with the arts and did not with the others. And what they found is their stress levels actually lowered their cortisol levels lowered they reported less depression they reported uh more positive thoughts um improved well-being overall and a decreasing negative emotions and increased positive feelings so even when someone's going through something as powerful as chemotherapy and the uncertainty and fear associated with having cancer something as simple as art which we just think might be fun or a frivolous activity actually improves your health and I think it's lowering your your blood pressure and it's making you think about something else than all of the negative things around you yeah it's definitely the fact that the, the hardest times in my life I, are the times I've spent the most time in photography mm -hmm. because it's helped to get me through them and I know too that sometimes there are things I just can't say with words and for me that's when I've done some conceptual photography and I've been able to say the things I'm too afraid to say with words in a picture. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of artists do that with their work, whether it be photography or painting or sculptures. Photography is also the most effective way to tell a story, I think. And this ranges from personal stories to the story of wildlife, to third parties, as well as stories of worldwide events, I think. One of the things I really like about photography is that there's no language barrier so and i love this about art in general whether it be a painting or a sculpture as i said but with photography it's a universal language just showing someone what you're thinking and feeling with a picture and something as simple as color can bring all of these moods out in a person um and it, it lets you see the the lives of others which I know for me as a child growing up, we had this big stack of National Geographics because at the time this would be the one magazine you'd save. Yeah. And I could go back through these old magazines and I was probably not going to read their 10,000 word articles, but I could absorb the pictures and I could see the photos of these people in other parts of the world living their lives. Um, and even now you could go back to those magazines and see them captured in that time. You know, perhaps it was some South American tribe and their kind of interesting cultural habits. And maybe that tribe is completely gone now, but their story is still being told because those photos, which are so easy to consume, persist through history. Yeah. And I had that same exact experience. I can remember at my grandparents' house, they had a bunch of Nat Geos and I would spread them out and read them all. And it made the unimaginable come alive. Someone could have told me, oh, there's a tribe in Africa where they put dishes in their lips. And I could have never, first of all, I couldn't have read the whole Nat Geo article because I think I was like six. But I could sit there and think, wow, people are out there with their families feeling all of the same things that I'm feeling and having a completely different experience. And I think that it makes people connect to one another to see these raw interpretations of their everyday life. And we see that persist. I, you know, Facebook, you can post this text status. Mm -hmm. um, but what's more popular than Facebook or Twitter, which are mostly text-based? Instagram, which is mostly photo-based, because that's really what people want to see. You, it, it can, you can absorb so much more so quickly than reading a text, and it has so much more meaning. Uh, the, the format just continues to grow, despite the fact that you know, so many people in the world can read and write, and we have translators and stuff. Images still carry the most weight. I, I think that they do, and we see people moving into video now, too, mm -hmm. a moving image, because seeing is believing. Well, even now we have Photoshop and things like that, and, fo and video editing. There's certainly editing, which can kind of skew the way um, we perceive uh, an event happening. But seeing is really believing and just saying, I saw protesters. I mean, some people 
are beautiful with words and they can really paint a picture, but actually having a picture or video can be so powerful. So I wanted to give some examples of how photography has changed the world. Um, I think we all kind of feel that it does inherently, but there's some pretty impressive examples. And one of them is Lewis Hines. He was an American sociologist and photographer, and his photographs were instrumental in changing child, child labor laws in the United States. So, you know, they had kids in factories and um, in agriculture and in coal mines working. Usually they were poor because their family needed them to help bring in money. Um, and they didn't have any advocates for them. Yeah, nowadays you think of child labor as something that happens in faraway countries and factories. And... In the, but it, th that wasn't the case 100 years ago. That was just the way the U.S. was, and it changed for a reason. Yeah, and you know, it was kind of sobering for me to read about uh, the child labor laws because I realized that it was used because it was profitable. People knew that it was wrong. People weren't, Lewis Hines wasn't allowed to just walk into a factory and take pictures of kids. They didn't want people to know what was happening he had to dress up as other officials like a, some kind of inspector or something and go into the buildings and get pictures and sneak them they didn't want the truth known so terrible things can happen when someone doesn't have a voice and Lewin, Lewis Hines was a person that gave children a voice um, he documented kids working in coal mines in terrible conditions it's um, unbelievable to see these images of the kids just covered in coal dust, just completely covered in blackness. That, now that, that we now know would definitely cause lung cancer as well as many other types of, uh, well, ways to shorten somebody's life, to have them subjected while they're still growing uh, with no safety gear. Appalling. So for people listening, there's a picture of a young boy. I'd say he's probably about 8 to 10, and he's carrying two large buckets of grease, and he's just completely drenched in grease. His skin, his clothes, everything. Um, I just can't imagine if, if my child had to go through that. And here's another photo, and it's noon hour at Ewan Breaker, Pennsylvania Coal Company. Um, and this, is, this was taken in January of 1911. And there's oh, so many kids. How many do you think are there? 30 kids. And you can tell it's dark. It looks like he brought a flash. And they're all wearing the same worker uniforms, and they're covered in coal around their noses, their mouths. Um, they don't look very healthy. They'll kind of look frail and scruffy and no one would want to imagine that's what we were doing with our children. Yeah. So there was some child labor, labor anti-child labor movement happening at the time. But these pictures really uh, could be published and distributed throughout the country. And it was a big impetus behind uh, getting enough momentum to actually get these laws passed. Because nowadays it's real hard to get a law passed that holds business back. Yeah. But that's what they were doing. They were doing yeah. passing a law that ruined some businesses. I mean, we still go through that now. And we went through that at Standing Rock when people were saying, you know, it's controversial now. We talked about child labor then. There were, pe there were people that were arguing for child labor then because it was making them money. And these are the things that keep happening over and over in history. If they can get away with it and it's making them money or it's doing something positive for them, they will try to get away from, with it. So in 1904, the National Child Labor Committee was formed, and that's uh, who Lewis Hine was working for. In 1916, the United States Congress' first federal child labor law prohibited the movement of goods across state lines if um, the minimum age laws were violated. So they started to have some rules um, about how old children could be to work in these danger dangerous environments. Um, in 1938, the Fair Labor Standards Act was passed by Franklin D. Roosevelt, and that said that children under the age of 16 couldn't work during school hours, and uh, children under the age of 18 couldn't do certain dangerous jobs, so there started to be more regulations. But I was really surprised, like, 1938 is pretty light, and then it took <laughs> yeah. even longer for the rules to get more rigid, mm -hmm. so there was still, uh, like, it was child labor, but it was just... 
get, they were getting by with these iffy rules. Like they aren't really concrete and they weren't chasing people down. So you still had kids working in fields and things like that. And who knows how long it would have taken without the, uh, the images that give you that like emotional guttural reaction. Like I could read you a list of statistics that say that child labor is bad. But when you see a picture of a kid with an oil lantern on his head and his face covered in soot, you feel that's wrong. Oh my God, yeah. how could we ever have done that? Yeah, and, and also he had a lot of pictures of kids in factories with bare feet and they're standing on this machinery that we, that we know is really dangerous. And well, Let's talk about one of your favorite photographers, Mary Ellen Mark. Yeah, Mary Ellen Mark is a bit different um, because she wasn't necessarily working towards one goal like Heinz was. I really admire her as an individual because she wanted to give people that others did not want to see a voice. So um, prostitutes and the homeless population and homeless children that people saw as kind of a burden or troublemakers. Um, you can see here she was in Life magazine and her photos were featured in an article called Streets of the Lost about runaway kids in Seattle. She didn't just go out and snap pictures of these kids. We have a whole podcast about her, actually, or she's a part of one of our podcasts where, where we cover a few different photographers. But she didn't just go out and snap pictures and walk by and try to get close. She really developed relationships with these people so that they trusted her because she wasn't just exploiting people for her own photography. She actually wanted these people to have a voice. She wanted people to see them. She wanted to humanize them. And she did. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The pictures are really intimate. She got to know her subjects, um, you know, shots with wide angles uh, where the people feel very natural. Many of the shots, you know, might have been positioned a little bit, but they're true photographs because she was part of their lives. Yeah. And I think that her subjects also got to control the narrative much of the time. Yeah. She because told their story. She told their story and she let herself go into their world. And in our podcast about her, you'll learn about um, a girl named Tiny and Tiny was a child prostitute and living on the street. And she followed her into adulthood and she even tried to give her a home. Um, she tried to really take care of Tiny and she really cared for her. And we got to know Tiny's story because of that. And for me, um, reading about that and reading about Tiny, you start to see how a person gets to that point. And they're not just someone in the street that you avoid eye contact with anymore. Uh, you know that there's a story behind every person and there's a reason why everyone is in their situation. And Mary Ellen Mark was brave enough to dig in and to find out what those stories were. So I really admire her work. Hey, let's take a minute and thank our sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace is their web hosting provider. They make websites, but they make it incredibly simple and they make beautiful websites. So they have actual professional designers working for them. You can just drop your pictures in and choose from one of many different templates, something that reflects your own personal style. Uh, you can customize it a little bit and then share it with the world. And each one comes with a store, so you can sell your picture if you want. Yeah, actually make some of the money back, <laughs> allow you to put some more energy into your photography, right? It's all part of that yes, same so circle. Whether you need a domain, website, or online store, you can make your next move with Squarespace and get your free trial at squarespace.com. You know what I like is the Squarespace portfolio um, mobile app. I have it on my smartphone and I just put in my login and it keeps my portfolio synchronized even if I'm offline. So, you know, if I'm sitting next to somebody in an airplane and I don't have a signal, uh, they can be like, oh, you're a photographer. Can I yeah, see your like, work? And I sure. will whip it right out. Let me, what do you whip out? My smartphone, Chelsea. I can torture you by showing you my entire portfolio on Squarespace. <laughs> That's what Tony does. It, especially if you have a tablet, like an iPad or something. It looks remarkable. Anyway, uh, thanks, Squarespace. Visit squarespace.com slash Tony. Get a free trial, no credit card required. Use the coupon code portfolio to let them know that you heard about it from us and to get an extra 10% off. Dorothea Lang is another person that used her photography to really influence people. And she told a story, unlike Mary Ellen Mark, I think she had a more direct impact. And you'll know, you'll know what I mean in a second. So she, she started as a portrait photographer. And then she got a job with the Resettlement Administration, which helped poor families re relocate, poor migrant families. Mm -hmm. So she was out on assignment 
looking to photograph migrant workers and field workers, and she saw a sign that said Pea Pickers Camp. So she took that turn where the sign was, and she went off looking, and she saw that there had been um, a frost and that all of the crops had been frozen, so none of these workers had a jobs. And they were starving. They were sitting at the side of the road, and they were living in little tents, and they were living off of the frozen peas, and um, they had no work. They had no money, and they had no food. And she came upon this woman. A lot of people know her as the migrant mother and her children. And uh, she got out, and she got her story. Um she had been living off of frozen peas with her kids and they'd been eating birds that the kids killed and um, the Dust Bowl had moved many families off their land, leaving them to wander for work and shelter and food. So she was one of those people that just had to completely up and leave her life. So she took pictures of this woman and um, they got it got on the cover of newspapers all around the country. And when people actually saw how bad the crisis was, the devastation of the Dust Bowl and what it was doing to families, they were just so taken aback. I mean, they had heard it, they had read it, but they had not seen it. And a few days later, the government sent 20,000 pounds of food out to relieve these people that were starving. So because of those pictures, people were fed. Yeah, it's not, it's, it, the, the government and the people don't necessarily do what's the most right in any situation, but they, they do what they, they address the problems that they see yeah, and they fix their own feelings and photography because it can capture a moment and be distributed, carries those feelings around and motivates people and moves people in ways other media just doesn't. The woman in that picture, she actually, um, she moved away from that area before she was able to get the relief that was provided by the government. But when that picture just kept circulating because it was just a really famous picture and people reused it for all different movements, um, she became kind of like a local celebrity. People knew that she was the woman in the picture. And when she was much older, the trailer home that she lived in was destroyed by a fire. And because people knew who she was from the picture, tens of thousands of dollars were donated to her to help rebuild her home. So even though she didn't directly benefit from that famous picture of her at the time, years later, it came back to help her out. I thought that was really cool. Uh, another thing that people simply wouldn't have known much about at all was the, uh, and I put this in quotes, the Japanese internment camps uh, during World War II, where for people who aren't that aware of American history, we, well, we were at war with Japan and at, during World War II, and uh, the government decided that we just needed to, to put anybody of Asian origin into these internment camps. Yeah, more than 60% of them were Americans. They were ci American citizens, um, and they were trying to just put Japanese people in the internment camps, but of course it was anyone that they thought looked Japanese. Yeah, it pretty much just came down to um, what they look like. So they put over 100,000 people in these camps, and Lang went to Manzanar. But the government really didn't want, like a lot of people knowing about this. It was really on the down low. No, well, people knew about it, but... They put Lang on assignment, and she went out to Manzanar and took a bunch of pictures, including this one of this little girl with her brother holding all of their belongings. People were forced to pack up all of their things and just leave. And um, she went out, and she documented everything. She had some very powerful moving pictures, and the government did not want them seen. They weren't published. They just stayed um, property of the government. They were never distributed like the migrant mother picture until many years later. Um, but I thought that that was an interesting anecdote because people know that photography is powerful and you know it must be powerful if your own government doesn't want the truth to be seen. Mm. They won't reveal pictures of the truth. I find that inspiring on its own that as photographers, we have the power to reveal the truth. Yeah, they could have seen it as a security issue. Obviously, they thought the internment camps were improving security and a photo like that might have gotten them shut down or, or changed or... Anyway, uh, I think they didn't want people to be outraged because they wanted to do what they wanted to do with people and they yeah. didn't want it disputed. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It would have definitely been disputed because that's the power of it. But even though we didn't get to see the images at the time, 
they persisted through history. And that's a fantastic thing about photography is it sticks around. Whereas like the verbal stories that your father might tell you about your ancestors, those can fade, they can be told incorrectly, but photographs tell that moment. Yeah, and consistently. I, that's the part of the reason I wanted to do this podcast because history is important and it always repeats itself. And I think that we have to remember that as photographers, we do have a responsibility to put some purpose behind our pictures. But just even as non-photographers, we, we need to study history and we need to make an effort to not repeat the horrors that we've acted out before. And you don't need to be changing massive movements in the government. These can be pictures of, your, it can be your own story. Yeah. Pictures of your family, the things that you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Because even though it might seem mundane now, 20, 50, 100 years in the future, those pictures are still going to be around and the story will be very different. They, people won't necessarily know how you lived. Yeah. Well, this seeing these people's pictures made me feel so silly about some of the photos that I've taken uh -huh. that are, just seem so pointless by comparison. You know, that's I think, okay too. These well, guys had some pointless pictures. I'm sure they did, but I think sometimes <laughs> as photographers, we can get so swept up in just having an impressive looking photo visually that we forget to put some purpose behind it as well. Yeah, people have different motivations behind it. So those. Uh, pictures were largely suppressed during World War II. The first war where photography was really uncensored was the Vietnam War. And by kind of uh, lifting that restriction, uh, it, it created this massive movement. First, there was the anti-war press protesters in the early 60s, but that eventually led to the whole hippie era, something that the entire 70s are defined by and a term, a style, a lifestyle that people are still aware of today. And it, I think it largely came from the uncensored photographs of the Vietnam War. Uh, I wanted to show a couple of pictures, in particular this by Malcolm Brown, who was just a photojournalist. And this one's more graphic, so. Yeah, but uh, this Buddhist monk has decided that he uh, just wanted to essentially martyr himself by lighting himself on fire. And I can't imagine the strength it took the photographer to stand there and take these pictures. But the picture was really powerful and was seen all around the world. And this monk sacrificed his life essentially for this image. What would this have been without the image? Some people definitely would have seen it. They would have been terribly moved by it. Perhaps people would have told the story. But the images themselves, there are quite a few of them. You can see that this monk in the background actually has a camera. Mm-hmm. So he knows that he needs to document this event for the protest to be successful so it can be seen by as many people as possible. Yeah, but take away photography and it's a much less powerful act. At least the, uh, the scope of it would have been much smaller. Um, photo, uh, photojournalist Horst Foss, I think for the AP, captured uh, this image of a Vietnamese farmer and makes me well up a little bit, but he's showing his dead son to the soldiers who just killed him. They're in a, the soldiers are in the back of a truck and he picked up his child and raises it up to them to show them, look what you've done. And it's another image that was spread kind of worldwide and we get to see this, this tragic interaction and the real meaning that it has to the individual family. So it's not guns and shooting and explosions and something that you might see in an action movie, but it becomes this like very real and personal yeah. thing. And again, I think this, these images as well as so many, there are so many iconic images of the Vietnam war, uh, that I didn't even want to go through them all, but it, it drastically changed history, not just the Vietnam war. It didn't just start the era of the hippies and peace and protests and all that, but it's carried with a sense because we just, war has changed drastically since then. Yeah. And I can't imagine what it might be like if it weren't for imagery like this. Do you think that's part of the reason why we've gotten more um, detached with our war, while we're choosing weapons that aren't directly manned by people? You know, we're trying, it, it's kind of sad because you'd think people would see that and just say, man, killing is not right. We're ruining families. But it seems like we're just kind of shifting our tactics. You know? uh, I do think it's, I, I will say, in war, I do believe most governments, most military uh, will do their best to minimize the amount of civilian, civilian yeah. casualties. Uh, 
And I, I do think a large part of that has been the visual publicity of the innocents who were injured or killed like this child. So, um, I mean, I, I can't say that war could go away. I would love to see it go away. I, I don't know. I can't anticipate that. But I, I do appreciate that. I do think most governments go out of their way to minimize it, the civilian casualties. Better than nothing, right? I guess, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's end on a little more positive note and talk about uh, how photography has improved the kind of conservation efforts for both animals and things like national parks, environmentalism. Yeah, maybe I should start with this picture, which is called Earthrise. And this was taken by Bill Anders. Um, he wasn't on Earth, obviously. <laughs> this is this is uh, from one of our first lunar missions. Um, and what a lot of people don't realize, and I didn't realize it until Justin tipped me off, was that our lunar missions helped ignite the environmental movement. It was in its infancy in the 60s. And then uh, when we did the moon landing in 68 and this picture was taken, it kicked off the environmental movement because for the first time people saw the earth for being this vulnerable little thing in a vast space. And they realized we're all sharing this little vulnerable planet instead of just, you know, thinking that our resources are infinite. Um, so as I said, this picture was taken in 68 and then the EPA was formed in 1970. And a uh, woman from the EPA said that the image of the world from the perspective of a desolate lunar surface became an iconic reminder of our need to protect the Earth's fragile resources. Earth seems so big and indestructible from our perspective and so tiny and vulnerable when seen from space. Yeah, uh, an amazing symbol, uh, an experience that we definitely could not have had short I, of. I've seen uh, interviews with astronauts and they say that they wish every single person could have that experience of going out into space and looking down on Earth. And they say, there are no borders, you know, like you see on a map. There are no states or countries divided. We're all living on the same little blue marble and we have to share it and all of its resources. I'm saving up for my Blue Origin ticket just so I can see that. Doesn't that just go to like the out, just the outside? You got to save up for the moon. All right. I, I'm just saying, I don't think anybody's <laughs> offering me a ticket further away. <laughs> We're working on it. Yeah. I'll get out as far as I can, man. Set the bar high. <laughs> Are you going to go to Mars? Uh, not if I can't come back. I think I like Earth a little too much. <laughs> uh, let's talk about Ansel Adams, who... Uh, was a naturalist and photographer who spent a great deal of time in national parks in the U.S., but also what would become national parks, partly because of what Ansel Adams was doing. Before Ansel Adams, people really didn't have a widespread appreciation for landscape photography. His work really defined that. And his work made, especially the American public, a appreciate these natural beauties because especially at the time you know you had farmers in the rural areas and then you had just people crammed into urban areas but you didn't have a lot of people just like out of the mountains that was considered like no man's land like you couldn't really live out there so they really didn't get to take in this beauty but Ansel dedicated his life to just taking these images spending months and months and months at a time and because they became popular because they got printed because they were made into calendars and such, people started to appreciate it. In 1938, he published uh, Sierra Nevada, the John Wuerr Trail. And this book in particular kicked off um, some uh, legal action that helped create s several specific national parks where he had taken the pictures. Wow. So in a way, his pictures and the book helped to protect that environment. Not only did they capture it at the time, but they helped to make sure that it didn't change as much as perhaps it otherwise would have. Didn't he also protest for preservation as well? Yeah, he, he personally was a big activist. And I think his photography, you know, photography will feed into your own personal appreciation for nature. So when you're out there taking landscape photos, you're probably doing it because you already like nature. Yeah. But being out there makes you appreciate it all that much more. And I think Ansel himself got caught up into that cycle and everybody should get a little 
caught up into that cycle. But because photography is so shareable, you can bring everybody else into this kind of appreciation. Uh, I love uh, nature photography. Yeah. What's more relaxing and peaceful? You start to realize, you're like, oh, yeah, this is where I'm supposed to be. I just heard a bird. That seems right. (laughs) (laughs) Um, There was an example. Well, this was a powerful picture. So it's a bunch of men carrying a, a dead gorilla. And this was taken in uh, Virunga National Park in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And this is an area where half of the world's mountain gorillas live. Um, There was a conflict there and he was shot and killed. Um, People were illegally harvesting wood to be used in the charcoal industry and they were destroying the mountain gorillas habitat so when people saw this picture they were outraged and it led to nine african countries including the congo signing a legally binding treaty to help protect the mountain gorillas in this park so and they're doing this out of respect they're not just um you know trying to get them out of the way they they're really mourning this animal in this picture and they know the importance of having him there It also, that image made me think of Jane Goodall, and she did a lot of great work, but I started thinking, what would her work have been without the images to go along with them? And she was in National Geographic all of the time. Um, I remember the pictures, but I can't say that I remember reading the article when I was a kid. You know, yeah, I, I don't know that either, but I still knew what the cause was. And even at a very low level as just a child, I can remember thinking, oh, these animals have families too, and these animals have their own homes too. Mm. And um, her work and her pictures with the chimps really led to their cons- conservation. So she helps preserve the land that they live in, um, and she helps spread the word that they are complex animals with a lot of feelings and that they deserve their spot in the world just as much as we do. And there's still these types of conservation websites, of course. Um, so this one is Chimp Haven. And I just wanted to go on and see how they're using photography now. And you can see that they're using individual portraits of chimps. If you're listening, there's a page and there's, it's like a meet the chimps page. And there's a bunch of portraits. They're all really cute. Uh, I didn't realize how much character each individual face had until I I started looking through them. Um, But what I'm getting at is that when you get people to connect to the individual animal, you don't necessarily have to understand all of the politics involved with conserving their environment. You just care about them and you just want to click donate. You're like, I don't know what's going on, but if this guy needs a house, I'm buying it. You know? So even yeah, if we were all Vulcans, you could just give us a list of facts and we would donate some money, but that's not the way we are. We're yeah. feeling people We're yeah. and people are visual. Mm -hmm. If you can show them a scene, they will feel and they will do the right thing. Chimps are pretty cute, I'm going to donate to that. These guys are really (laughs) cute. (laughs) Oh, this has been an emotional podcast, Kelsey. There are so many examples. I've been researching this for so long and I just had to cut it off somewhere. Yeah, I'd actually like to ask people to write a comment down below and, and give your own example of how photography has changed either you personally or something in the world. Hopefully for the better. Hopefully for the better. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much for watching. Remember to take the time to put some purpose into your photos. I think everyone has their own way that they can contribute to using their photography to put some good into the world. I want to thank Squarespace for making this podcast possible so that we can teach, teach people about history and photography. If you want your very own Squarespace, go to squarespace.com slash Tony and enter the offer code portfolio. Squarespace is a great way to make your pictures look awesome. Uh, and it's really inexpensive and you don't have to be a nerd. <laughs> Thanks Squarespace and uh, subscribe and listen to our podcast online at scp.io slash podcast. Bye.